Welcome to the faculty administration of Lubbock Cooper High School. On behalf of First Lubbock, we want to say thank you for allowing us to host this worship event tonight. Do us a favor as we begin, if you would, share the live stream with your friends on Facebook. And to the graduating seniors of 2020 of Lubbock Cooper High School, we say major congrats. Way to go. We hope that tonight you'll see this as yet another step in your ongoing, ever-continuing journey in becoming all that God wants you to be. Thank you for allowing us into your homes tonight or wherever you may be. You're going to hear from some of your classmates who have lived out their faith among you throughout the day-to-day at Lubbock Cooper. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to be challenged from God's Word. So as we begin, let's thank God for meeting us here or there, wherever you may be. And let us dive headlong into the 2020 Lubbock Cooper High School Baccalaureate. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for meeting us here or there. Thank you that you are that big, huge, amazing God who can be all places all at the same time. And may our worship here tonight be reflective of our great big God. May you be honored and may it bring a smile to your face to see all of us scattered all over the place, lifting you up, singing your praises. Bless this time, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. joy in the midst of trying circumstances. So tonight, let's give him all praise and all glory and all honor and all worship because he's worthy. Let's sing it out. Here we go. I need to rescue my 
my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me. I'm Lane Bloomer, um, so I was just asked to talk about uh, what I'm going to be, what I've been through in high school, and how God has uh, moved in my life. And so, if my voice cracks, uh, you can laugh. I can't do anything about it really, but um, yeah. So I'm just going to go for it. So we were asked to speak on how our faith has sustained us through our time in high school, um, and that is my story. God has been my helper and my sustainer through my time here, and I believe my story tells the greatness of God um, and the truth of who He is. You know, there's not a promise that life will be sunshine all the time. There's actually a promise of a lot of trial and darkness. Um, but He's faithful through it, and my story is a testament to that. I truly have been blessed with the life I have, and I'm grateful for it. But I've experienced the trial and the darkness with it. Uh, when my family was living in Alabama, my dad lost his job and was without steady employment for a year and a half. That time for us was a test of dependence and faith, but He's a God of faithfulness. And then he called us to be on mission in China, and we had to raise $25,000 in two months before going, and God made it happen, no problem. Uh, he's a God who provides. We get back from China, and within six months, we lost another job and our place to live within two weeks, and God filled both of those vacancies um, because he's a God who stays. Our freshman year, I had to stand with my best friend in the dirt outside his house where his parents died on the same night. That's a place void of anything good, but God was good and faithful in the valley of the shadow of death, and he had a gentle hand. He's the God who cares. In each of these circumstances, the goodness of God overcame the trials of life. But I want to share what it has to offer you. I won't assume that everyone listening is a believer. Maybe you are. Maybe your faith is strong. But maybe you've been moving through life not acting on your faith. Maybe you have shallow faith, and maybe you have no faith at all. Uh, and you've been walking through life without a helper and sustainer. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. Uh, as we move into college or careers, God offers the same thing to each of us, and that's Himself. This year, if life has taught me anything, it's the aspect of reliability. This world's not reliable. Sports have been canceled, academics have been halted and changed formats, people are losing jobs, relationships have lost contact due to isolation. These things have all proven to be unreliable because of a virus. These things aren't reliable and they're not faithful. But my God is a God of faithfulness and He's proven Himself to be faithful and to be steadfast throughout history. People are created with an inherent dependency on something bigger than themselves. For us seniors moving forward into life, we have an option of what we'll depend on. Will we choose these things that aren't steady, or will we choose the sure foundation? Will we choose to live for ourselves or for His eternal purpose? That's the offer for each of us. No matter what your faith is like or what your life is like, we all have the same invitation from God to give our lives and be faithful to Him who has already been faithful to us. So that's the God I know. That's the truth of who God is in my life. And once again, regardless of your standing in life, I just encourage you to be faithful to God. I encourage you to lean into Him. Lean into the one who is faithful. Lean into truth. Lean into hope. Lean into love. Thank you all and God bless. Hi, my name is Rachel Kinley and as many of you know, navigating high school is not easy. I started my freshman year at Friendswood High School knowing almost everybody. We all grew up with each other. I took that for granted. All of a sudden, everything came tumbling down and I was in this great unknown called Lubbock. Long story short, my parents and I moved here a week before my sophomore year had started. Many people know me as an outgoing and sociable person, 
However, having to start the school year knowing only one person brought me a lot of stress and anxiety. Everyone had already established their friend groups freshman year. I remember my first day at Cooper. I walked into Mrs. Thompson's English class and sat straight down. Everybody was greeting their old friends they haven't seen in a while, and there I was, sitting alone. It took me almost the whole year to open up, make friends, and try to fit in. It was a long year to say the least. The one stable part of my life that stuck by my side during this move was scripture. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11 through 14 say, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This gives me comfort knowing no matter how difficult a situation and no matter how alone I feel, God has a plan for me. I may have started my time at Cooper knowing only one person, but I'm ending it with the opportunity of speaking here in front of you all today. Moving on to this new adventure in life called college is only a step in Christ's ultimate journey for us. Lastly, to me what gives the best advice when moving to an unknown point in your life, whether it's high school, college, living on your own, or starting a new job. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9 and 14 give me hope by saying, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Congrats to the class of 2020 and good luck with your next step in life.
It has been quite a weird semester. I surely never thought it would have ended like this. My name is Theron Zachary, and I'm going to talk about how I found my faith in high school. Throughout my years at Lubbock Cooper, I have faced many challenges that have tested my faith and devotion towards God. Growing up as a pastor's daughter, I always felt pressured to have my relationship with God figured out. I never really understood the significance in a personal relationship, and I just assumed we believed in God because that's what we're supposed to do. I feel as if every believer has a pivotal moment that makes them sure of God's presence, yet I never had one. I had struggled throughout my middle school and high school years with depression, anxiety, and self-harm. I couldn't fully believe in my heart that He was real. I remember asking myself why God would allow me to hurt so bad, and why He had to choose me to go through it. I decided on a whim one day to start praying before I went to bed at night. I prayed that I could learn to love myself. I prayed for my family. I prayed for those who have wronged me. And I prayed for every single person I could think about and hope that God would move in their lives and mine. The relief I felt after the first time I prayed, it was the first time in a while I had felt as if things were going to be all right. No matter what happened to me, I knew I was going to be okay. Though I never had God come to me in a dream or seen a miracle happen firsthand, I saw how he used me to help those who have issues like myself, those who have struggled like me. I plan on using my faith and continuing to help others in my college career by studying psychology and hoping to become a therapist so I can show the compassion to others that God has shown me. Hi, my name is Zach and I'm going to Love Christian University and I will be majoring in animal science and I am also running cross country for them. I've always been a person that smiles nearly all day every day and everyone usually comments something like, Zach is always happy and optimistic or something along those lines and there is a reason for that. I got God and Jesus. I pray about nearly anything and everything that makes me anxious, stressed, joyful, the list goes on. My faith in Christ has indeed sustained me through high school. There is no doubt about it. I guess the thing that got me through the thick and thin, good and bad, and everything in between was the fact that I know that Jesus was with me through it all and that he has great plans for me. Even as we were going through this pandemic, I can't do anything but smile because God has got my back. As we start a new and exciting chapter in our lives, I know that Christ will guide me to where He wants me to be. I know that college is going to be challenging and tough, but with God by my side, there's nothing I can't do. All in all, wherever I go and wherever I am, I know that God is with me. And who can't keep a smile when the one who has made them is always by their side? Speak to me, you're the only voice I want to hear, walk with me, show me who you are as I draw near, if you're not in Take the whole world and give me Jesus. Let all else fade away. Satisfied. You're the only one I live in
Take the whole world and give me Jesus. Let all else fade away. Let all else fade away. Let all an honor to get to speak to you grads and families of grads. Uh, those of you that are watching along with us online, it's an honor to get to share God's Word with you tonight. Thank you, uh, Libby and Johnny and Haley and the band for leading us tonight. Hamlet famously says, Act 3, Scene 1, to be or not to be, that is the question Really a profound question as he contemplates the, the meaning of life and the value of life in his own life and what to do when trouble comes and often quoted and widely known and yet really not all that important of a question in our lives. But there are questions throughout our life that alter the course of things. In high school, it feels like Will you go out with me will alter the course of things. It feels like a lot of the, the decisions made in high school will alter the course of things. And, and lots of big questions are asked. I know in my life, one of the scariest questions I asked, even though we knew the answer and I'd already had the conversations, will you marry me? Maybe a question that should have been scarier if we understood the weight of it, but young as we were and as love as we were, uh, do you take this uh, bride and sickness and health? Big questions that altered the way my life went on. That my life was different before that question than it was after. Scripture is rife with questions like these, questions like when Paul offers in Galatians the, the self-questioning of, am I really here to please man or am I here to please God? Questions that Jesus asked his disciples, O ye of little faith, why do you doubt? Maybe the most profound question in all of Scripture found in Mark chapter 8 when Jesus has already asked the first question to set the ball on the tee. Who do people say that I am? And then he turns it directly at the disciples. He says, but who do you say that I am? I want to talk about a question found in Scripture, a, a question found in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel I often talk about in my, my sermons and my discussions with students and, uh, and with college students that I really have always loved Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is a weird prophet because uh, he prophesies to nobody the entire book. He is just a diary with him and God. This too is a prophecy uh, that seems unusual at first because at least at the beginning it is a prophecy to no one. Ezekiel, in chapter 37, finds himself lifted up and placed somewhere else. 37, verse 1, the, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. 
and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Before we go any further, I, I think it's an important, though obvious, distinction here uh, that these bones do not appear to be dead. These bones don't have the appearance of lifelessness. They are fully dead and so dead that they are now dry. Flesh gone, tendon gone, muscle gone. Even the moisture of the bone is gone. You may find yourself in what feels like a valley of dry bones as seasons have been canceled and prom and graduation not the way you anticipated. Classes uh, uh, severed at spring break, uh, and, and, and teachers have done just an incredible job. I'm married to one. I know how difficult it is to have carried on the rest of the semester, uh, and, and yet here you find yourself in an incredibly difficult conversation, and I don't think there's any reason that we should have to pretend like it's not so bad. We don't have to pretend like this is no big deal. We can acknowledge that the thing that I had planned for the end of this semester is really dead. It really is heartbreaking. It, it really is devastating, and it's okay to acknowledge that. Back to the story. He says, can these bones live? And I, Ezekiel, answered, Oh, Lord God, you know, that's a good answer when God asks you a question that you don't know. Just turn it back to him. I, I don't know. You know. You know everything. And then he, God, said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you. And you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, put breath in you, and, Lord, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I feel particularly uh, licensed to speak on the uncomfortableness of preaching to an empty room. Ezekiel is asked to prophesy, that is, to proclaim the message of the Lord to a valley of dead, dry bones. Nothing prepares you for that sermon. It's uncomfortable. It's confusing. I, I have to assume, as faithful as Ezekiel might have been, he had to be wondering, why is it that the bones get this message? And yet, unlike how I would have responded, Ezekiel, verse 7 so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. Flesh had come upon them, skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. So he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. I don't know what's more unusual, being asked to preach to a valley of dry bones or being asked to preach to these newly formed bodies but are still dead. And yet in both situations, the same line is used, so I prophesied as I was commanded. There's something supernatural about the way God can use our simple obedience. There was nothing magic in the, the breath that came out of Ezekiel's mouth. When his tongue hit the back of his teeth to form the consonants that we form every day, it was no different than when we speak, and yet God used his simple obedience to do something supernaturally miraculous. Here we are looking at our own valley of dry bones. It looks different for all of us. And yet the same truth applies that God can do supernaturally miraculous things if you will just simply be obedient. 
And so here we are in front of a, a great army and now uh, bone has come to bone and sinews and tendons and muscles and all these things have wrapped around these things. Now we've got skin coming around that. I have no idea what it looked like, uh, but I imagine quite the whirlwind, quite the spectacle. I want to caution you. Don't say, man, what would it have been like to get to see God move in that way? Because I want to tell you something. I do not believe with any part of my body that God uh, sent down coronavirus to prove some point. But what I do believe is that God is still moving despite tragedy, despite loss, despite grief. That God is still moving. And if we will simply open our eyes to the things that he is doing, that we too will be privy to a spectacle. I pray a very simple prayer regularly. God, do something so big that we can't explain it with any other means than God did that. And the reason I pray that is because if I start praying for very specific things, and don't get me wrong, I still pray for very specific things, but if that's all I do, then what tends to happen is I pray for the things I want, not necessarily the things I need, and then I get very narrow with my vision. And so when God doesn't do that thing that I wanted him to do, then I convince myself that God must not be moving. But when I broaden my horizons by praying simple prayers, like God do something so big that we can't explain it by any other means than God did that, then I start to see all the things on the periphery that I was missing. And they're not small things. They're spectacles. They're supernaturally miraculous that God is moving and shaking and molding things into his image all the time. And if we would just simply look, we too could get glimpses of what God's doing here. Yes, Ezekiel got a very physical picture of that, a very clear picture of that. It's about to explain the prophecy, but I'm going to guess you wouldn't need uh, God's explanation to Ezekiel to understand what this means. Sometimes ours aren't that clear, but what I'm telling you is if we'll just open our eyes to see things the way that God sees them, what you will find out is he's never stopped moving. Just because you took your eyes off of him doesn't change his character. 2 Timothy 2 says, despite the things we do, God remains faithful because he cannot disown himself. It's his very nature to be faithful. And so despite our failure and despite our uh, our constant uh, uh, wandering eyes where we stop focusing on the things that he's doing, He's still moving, and he's still working, and we get to be a part of that. Then he said to me, verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Maybe you feel like that. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the Lord God says. Behold, I will open up your graves. I will raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. I've spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Really quickly, that last line, and we're going to move back up. When God speaks, he does it. That's a promise you can cash in every single time. So what is his promise? His promise is that our dry bones are made alive again, that we've been called up out of our graves to live anew. And he calls, oh, he says, oh, my people, oh, my people. I don't know if you know much about the Israelite history. They were a bad people to call, oh, my people. You probably have people in your life that, man, you, you, 
you keep helping and you keep uh, bending that knee and you keep helping them out and you keep coming to their aid and yet over and over again they abandon your trust right you, you start to trust them again you tell them a little something they abandon that trust and and eventually if you're logical like most of us eventually we get to the point where we go okay that's enough and yet God never gets there now God does get to the place where he goes okay uh, there's going to be a punishment for this But even despite all those things, he calls them his people. Right? Our, our proximity to God, our relationship to God is not uh, uh, reliant upon our obedience, but upon his goodness, and that doesn't change. And he says, because you're my people, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And now I would be remiss if we stopped there. I want you to understand that we have a responsibility to this redemption. That this redemption that we've been given, these, these uh, formerly dry bones turned into living flesh that we are as believers, that we have a responsibility to this redemption. I don't know why God chooses to use us. Angels seem like a much more logical choice. They're much more obedient, at least it appears in Scripture. I'm disobedient on the hour. And yet, according to the way that I read Scripture, God has chosen us, the church, to be his primary conduit of his love to the world. I don't know what's next for you. It might be military. It, it might be workforce. It might be junior college. It might be a four-year university. Maybe you still don't know what's next for you, but... We have a responsibility that because Christ has made me alive, because my dead bones have been redeemed, because I have been called up out of that grave, that now I get to play a small part in the redemption of other people. That God chooses and desires to use me. Whatever my path leads, that God chooses to use me, that I would be on my way, that I would make disciples, teaching them the things that he's taught us. It's a high bar. I certainly am not promising it will be easy, but I promise you it'll be worth it. Thank you. So before we go... If you will, if you're with your family or friends in a room, if you grab a hold of one of them. And if you're by yourself, you can just stick your hand up. And I want to pray a prayer of blessing over this class. So let's bow together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the words we've heard tonight, for the words we've sung back to you, for the faith stories of people who have been devoted to you and tried to serve you in school I pray your blessing on this class as they leave and go to parts unknown, probably all over the world. And I pray as they love them, their neighbor as they love themselves, as they love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, God, you would revolutionize the environments in which they find themselves. God, you would use them as a, a mighty force to change the world in which they have inherited, a world that's torn and divided. God, may they bend their knee to nothing and no one else other than you. May they live out the words they sang tonight. That if, if you're not in it, they don't want it. And that they would like for you to take everything the world has to offer and just give them Jesus. The Lord, may he bless you. And may he keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may this same Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And you then share that peace with all you come in contact. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congratulations.
Lubbock Cooper High School class of 2020.